You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. We are back. This is Barbell Logic Podcast, and I'm Scott Hamburg. Of course, Matt Reynolds is here. And the Alec Baldwin of the Barbell Logic Podcast, our, <laughs> our ever-present <laughs> guest, Dr. Sullivan. But we wanted to talk about relative merits and demerits of the power clean today. Right. And when you talk about something that has relative merits and demerits, you don't give it a clickbaity title like <laughs> why you absolutely should slash should not Oh no, that's, do that's, that's exactly this thing. what you do. We got, we got to cut through the noise. We got to. That's right. You guys have gone over to the dark side. Hey, we're that's not advertising to the 135 no, no, IQ, I, slightly autistic crowd th that appeals to the rest of us. I get it. You know, and like you said, I haven't seen the script. So hopefully you're taking a pretty measured approach. So, and the other thing is, you know, I work for you guys. I program some of my clients to do the power clean. I don't want to get fired. <laughs> yeah. no. So when is the power clean indicated, sir? I always tell people I have three criteria for prescribing the power clean. And number one, the client has to want to do it. Because if a client doesn't want to do cleans, right, they're just going to suck at it. You have to have it more so even than the other exercises. If you're not committed to doing the power clean, you're just going to suck at it and you're just going to get hurt. I'm taking notes, by the way. Client Number has to want to do it. <laughs> Check. Two. This seems kind of sarcastic to me. No, I agree oh. with that. So, no, oh, okay. The number two is the client has to have the aptitude. I mean, yeah. if you get somebody, you know, on the platform and you try them out with a power clean, I mean, you guys have all seen this. You get somebody on the platform and they're sure. just a complete wombat. You know, they're not going to be able to do the power clean. They just mm -hmm. don't have that level of athleticism and coordination. They're just never going to be good at it. It's going to be a waste of everybody's time. So they have to have the aptitude. They have to have the desire. They have to have the aptitude. And then this is critically important, especially in a master's population. They have to be able to tolerate the exercise. So I've had the experience of having people that's like, yeah, I like the power clean. That looks badass. It looks beautiful, right? And, and then you get them up there to do it and you do their first power clean session. It's like, yeah, you can do this. You know, you've got a certain level of aptitude for it. And then they come back to you and, you know, a couple of times in a row, you train the power clean. It's like, God, my knees, my elbows, my elbows. I'm all f***ed up behind doing that. It's like, well, you can't do it. Yeah. You just can't do it. So you have to have the desire, you have to have the aptitude, and you have to have the tolerance for the exercise. And right away, when you apply those criteria, a bunch of people get taken off the table, especially in a master's population. The majority of them get taken off the table. But I'm not going to, you know, proscribe the exercise generally. I mean, for people who like to do it, people who can do it, and for people who tolerating do it, it can be an incredibly rewarding exercise. And, you know, for a variety of reasons. I know that He's this is- He's getting ready to use our rhetoric against this. Here we go. I know I that know. this is a minority view. It comes voluntary hardship. I feel it. Well, yeah. That, it, <laughs> I feel it coming. That's coming. That's coming. So spread them wide, right? It's coming. <laughs> so first of all, I know this is a minority opinion, but I do believe that power clean actually trains power. It actually trains your capacity- to move explosively. It's a fundamentally different type of lift from the other lifts that we do. It's not a slow lift. It's an extremely rapid, graceful, technically demanding lift in a way that the other lifts aren't. And so it allows for a certain transfer of athleticism of the raw strength that we're developing under the slow lifts to something else. It adds variety to the program. And I think that Andy Baker spoke very eloquently to the benefits of adding variety of the program instead of like the same four lifts day in and day out. I know this is also a minority opinion. I do think of it as an accessory pulling exercise. So it doesn't drive strength in the deadlift you know, like training the deadlift, right? But what it does do, it is a pulling exercise. It is a pulling variant. So it allows the lifter to practice setting their back and doing other technical elements that are, you know, 
universal among pulling exercises. So it can be viewed as an accessory pulling exercise. It introduces the lifter to the world of Olympic weightlifting, right? It opens up that whole world to somebody. So what you may do when you train somebody in the power clean who has the desire, aptitude, and tolerance for it is you can introduce them to this whole new training way of life, a whole new, you know, strength sport passion that will open up to them. And, you know, for masters in particular, but everybody in general, the sense of accomplishment that comes from mastering this incredibly athletic, incredibly demanding, graceful, beautiful movement, you know, you just can't put a value on that. So, there is a virtue that attaches to that. And the difficulty of the movement is its own reward. So yeah, the voluntary hardship thing comes into it as well. So you can't say, you know, we like to do some things because they're virtuous and they're an exercise of voluntary hardship and only apply it to some things. I mean, those things are either good or they're not, and I think they're good. So the majority of people, especially in my population, probably not going to do it. But for those who meet the criteria, I think it can be very, very worthwhile to train the power clean. Yeah, I don't see anything there that I would disagree with. I think that we might disagree about who has the aptitude. Like, for example, we audited a seminar not too long ago, and I think there were about 35 people in that seminar. I think there were five people in there that should be prohibited by law from attempting it. They I were, probably would not have disagreed with you about who those five people were. And then there were probably, I think that there might have been uh, maybe five that would benefit from it in terms of their strength, right? In terms of it being an accessory pulling exercise of a significant But I don't think heaviness. it rewards us with a lot of strength. I think, I think its impact on our raw strength development is indirect at best. It makes our deadlift right. better, so okay. maybe we can pull a little bit more. The other thing it teaches is our ability to commit to a movement pattern, right? So, you know, the slow lifts, the level of initial neuromuscular, I don't know about you guys, but I'm old. And when I squat, that first few inches of squat is like, are we in the pipe? Are we, are mm -hmm. we in the, okay, okay, we can go, right? But the power clean, you can't do that, right? When you do the power clean, you have to commit to the movement and then the chips fall where they may, right? It's just a different kind of thing right. that you're doing. So I think it's, I think its contribution to the development of raw strength is indirect at best. So I don't think it drives strength gains, right? I think it drives a different kind of gain, the ability to express strength quickly, the ability to commit to a movement pattern, and it adds a whole new level of grace and balance and technical excellence. It brings out the best in a coach, too. Carl Shute made this point the other day, like, you know, Coaching the power clean kind of separates, you know, the wheat from the chaff, I think. Sure. If you can coach the power clean, you know, you're a little bit of a cut above, I think, because we know a lot of good coaches. You who, should be able to coach the power clean. You should. We're all going to agree on the fact that there are people who clearly should power clean. And we're all probably going to agree that there are quite a few people who shouldn't should not. power clean. And where, where we may differ is the people who are not so clear cut that end up in the middle of that spectrum. And so, uh, however... Because there are people that should power clean, undoubtedly, then good coaches should be able to teach it, just as they should be able to teach the power snatch. 100% right? agree. Like those things are important things to be able to teach. I think it takes an enormous amount of time. So when we are talking about the sort of time economy, and not only that, but the financial cost of a power clean or learning a power clean for our clients who are paying us for some of the most expensive coaches in the world. Mm -hmm. I can teach them how to do a deadlift in 20 minutes, and it takes me a full hour to teach them how to do a power clean poorly. And you can teach a barbell row in three minutes? Yeah, it's pretty quick. So for me, I don't disagree with any of the things that you just yeah. said. I actually think that all of the things you said I would agree with. My major counterpoint is I think there's almost always something that would work better than the power clean. It's not that the power clean is worthless, but the power clean doesn't accomplish those things. Well, here's a maybe an easier way to say it. If we can agree, if we can find common ground, which the common ground is that we don't tend to think the power clean drives strength up for the vast majority of people, right? For young, explosive athletes who can power clean 60 plus percent of their deadlift, then maybe it actually contributes to really significant. Uh, maybe a little bit. I mean, strength grows in the range in which it's trained, but then I think power does too. And so if you have a young athlete, the ability to express their strength is power. Speed expressed quickly is important, but I don't think it makes huge contributions to either. raw strength development. Okay, so I assume you agree with that as well, right? Yes. I do think that 
we get used to doing the slow lifts. They have to be done slow. Heavy deadlifts, you just can't do them fast. Right. And we do get kind of get a motor pattern where you just like, okay, I'm humped over. I got the bar in my hands and it's going to be slow. Right. Yeah. And so I think doing something different is good. Well, and so then the argument that I would make, at least from a philosophical standpoint, is to say, well, since the vast majority of people that we have, it takes a tremendous amount of time for them to get, quote unquote, strong enough, right, that we don't do conditioning in the beginning and we don't do... Any of these other things that don't contribute to strength. And my question is, why are we doing a thing that is explosive and produces power and is an expression of strength, but it doesn't contribute to strength during the novice LP? I think that's a very valid question, Matt. I don't disagree with that question at all. I think that's a penetrating and valid question and one that deserves consideration. And so most of the time when I have introduced the power clean for masters has been somewhere after the novice phase has been completed. And for the vast majority of masters, I don't have a power clean day. I have a light deadlift day. That's what I do on the day that the program calls for the power clean. I just put in a light deadlift instead. So yeah, I think it's a little bit like conditioning. It's something that's, you know, that can be introduced later as to why the canonical program does it that way. I think it was, you know, possibly, you know, that was the way it was done before. And there was the economy of presentation. And if you're not going to cover the power clean for new lifters and coaches in the seminar, when are you going to do it? I think that there's ways that it can be done more efficiently to be sure. I mean, there's in particular, there's, you know, one section of that, that takes a lot of time that I don't think needs to take that much time, you know, and I've seen you coach the power clean. It doesn't take you really an hour to coach the power clean. You can get somebody who has the aptitude. You can get somebody who has the aptitude to do the power clean in a half an hour. And the people who don't have the aptitude, correct me if I'm wrong, you recognize those people right away, don't you? Yeah, I do. You know know who they're going to be right away. And I don't think we as coaches should be shy to say, look, this is not going to be your thing. Sure. You know? So I've learned this from Reynolds. And when I went through LP, at the very end of it, I cleaned. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, I cleaned poorly. I did notice a difference in the speed off of the floor with the deadlift. And so I knew, or at least I think I know that breaking up that muscle memory, like this is how fast I think take things off the floor was very, very helpful. And then you see this, you know, West side guys are like, we're going to do speed work today, right? Speed work, uh, speed. Dead speed deadlifts, power gonna do, deadlift, power deadlifts, you know, deadlift you're going to do power. dynamic effort. Mm, all yeah. that same thing. Yeah. I don't know that that carries over for strength either, but it can help accomplish that breaking that motor pattern of doing the deadlift slow. Very, and so I'll have yeah. them do that. Yeah, we're very clear about that, for example, in the barbell prescription. So we present the uh, power clean and the snatch in the barbell prescription. And then there's caveats all over the place, all over that chapter. It's like, maybe you really shouldn't do this. You're probably not going to want to do this. And then we talk about dynamic effort sets and that kind of thing to fill in that gaposis of, you know, speed work, which I think gap-osis. is important. Yeah, the gaposis. The, Good word. The, yeah, to fill that in and say, look, there's other ways that you can get this done, I absolutely agree 100%. On the other hand, you know, I keep coming back to to the virtue argument. Virtue is a powerful argument. And when you can get like some 67-year-old lady to do a beautiful clean and jerk, I mean, there is, and watch what happens to her. There's just nothing like it. And then that client is, you know, she's bought in then, you know. And I'll be honest, uh, I'm not bold enough or confident enough to teach a 67-year-old lady of any stripe to power clean. I'm not saying it shouldn't be done. I'm not going to do that. I'm not skillful enough with the power clean and the older population to do that. It would scare the shit out of me. I would let you teach my mom, who's 71 and a broken giraffe, to do it, but I'm afraid to do that. You have to select the right people. They have to have the desire, the aptitude, and the tolerance. And that just takes a lot of people out of the running, especially in a master's population, right away. But in any population, it takes a lot of people out of the running. I don't know how fair it is to them and their use of their time to do it. You're right about the virtue of the thing. You know, uh, say that the squat is kind of like a Japanese tea service. You know, you just do it over and over again, just, Mm -hmm. you know, just chasing this perfection. And there's this meditative thing where you can be lost in the detail of the thing. And that exists in the power clean. And that's. Yeah. That can be important for those people that aren't going to benefit necessarily that much necessarily athletically but aren't so awkward that they're going to require dental work after they do it. (laughs) So I I understand what you're saying. Yeah. And so it does come down to your first criteria was, do they want to do it? And so, you know, if they want to do it, there's a lot that goes into that, right? It's like, what do they want to do? And they have the interest. 
Do they have the time? There's a bunch right. of stuff that's in that number one. Exactly. So I think for those people who can do it, want to do it, who can tolerate doing it, it can be incredibly rewarding. I understand reservations about including it in the program, especially for masters, and especially because, you know, everybody has a limited amount of time to meet their training goals. But for some people, that is a training goal. Yeah. And for some people, it, you know, it definitely feels a need. And so, you know, I guess where this is all coming from is, you know, I dislike categorical pronouncements. <laughs> uh, you're, so you're a very nuanced individual, Jonathan I, I am nothing if not nuanced. <laughs> That's the problem with your entire industry. <laughs> right. I know. Yeah, I get it. We hear that a lot. I mean, we make a lot of jokes. Like, it's clear I'm certainly more categorical than you are. I think part of the deal is, is that I'm... Than me? Comes, yeah. I'm not? I don't know. I thought I was pretty black and white. Well, but you are pretty black and white. And we both are. I just think it's one of those deals where, where we go, if it works for 98% of the population, I'm going to say it works for everybody. But you're a doctor, so you can't. You have to say, but what about those other two? And I'm going to say that the argument, when you even present the argument that there is such a thing as the other two, you don't get the two people that figure out that they're not the ones that are supposed to do it. You get 27 people who think they're not supposed to do it or whatever. Does that make sense? Right. You raise the question that says, so if you say linear progression works absolutely for everybody, but even more general than that, strength training works for everybody by your criteria, except it. It actually doesn't work for everybody. There are some people who just can't do this thing sure. that we're talking about, sure. and a coach has to recognize that. Yeah, but we include that in the message to say strength right. training doesn't work for everybody because Asterisk. my argument is it works for such a high percentage of people. No, no argument. When you say, except the nuanced answer is that it doesn't actually work for everybody. Now, the point zero 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 one percent of the population that it doesn't work for. That's not the return you get. You get 5% of the population comes back and says, well, strength doesn't work. I'm one of those guys. I'm a non-responder. I'm the <laughs> snowflake. And I go, look, that's why there are times that I'll make these categorical sort of blanket statements. This is the deal. That's kind of part of being a coach. You're not letting them out. Right. It's part of being a person. It's part of being a professional. And it's pragmatism in action is what it is. Yeah. You know, we reach a certain degree of consensus about things. And, but I still dislike categorical pronouncement. Yeah, I get it. That's fair. So who does the person that LP doesn't work for look like? What does it look like? Well, it's not so much that somebody can strength train. If they can train, then LP works. I mean, Sure. If you can train for strength, LP works virtually 100% of the time. Sure. Okay, so but not everybody can train, train for, for strength. strength. Right. So right. Uh, prepubescent kids can't do it. Right. You can't actually they train. Can't train. People who have a close relationship with their vascular surgeon can't do it. Right. You know, right. that kind of thing. People in chemo. You right. Know? Yeah. right. Okay. Well, actually, I've trained people in chemo. Right. Well, of course. I mean, John Wilson. Well, that's right. You know, what I was thinking about was the three criteria that you listed about the power clean that you said, for people to power clean, the client has to want to do it. The client has to have the aptitude and they have to be able to tolerate the exercise. And I think it's an important point to make that you can't apply those three criteria to everything that the first thing you did in order to get to the power clean was to look at our primary three criteria of most muscle mass, most weight, greatest effective range of motion. And when you take that infinite number of exercises and apply those three criteria, it narrows it down to a very small group of exercises. It does. Which does not include the power clean, in my opinion. Why? You can't move much weight. But it moves for much longer range of motion. It moves for long range of motion. And a lot of muscle mass. But is it doing anything? And so this is a fourth criteria that I've added. Is it redundant? No, for the reasons that I've explicated already. It's a different kind of exercise. I actually think the power clean falls cleanly under our three criteria for strength training and for valuable strength exercises. What I was trying to get at was, are there other exercises that we can all agree on the first three criteria? Mm -hmm. Now, on your criteria of the client has to want to do it, client has to have the aptitude and has to be able to tolerate the exercise. I'm thinking of things like chins. Chins would fall under that too, right? There are some people who can't mm -hmm. do chins. Uh, no, I agree, yeah. But chins are a valuable exercise Absolutely. for some populations. Dips. Dips are one of the, another one that probably are not quite as valuable as chins and probably a little more dangerous for some, but there are people who can. As a matter of fact, for chins, 
If I had a client who was physically capable of doing chins and was able to tolerate doing chins, I wouldn't give a sh whether she wanted to do them or not, you know? Or the same thing with squats, right? Sure, sure. If she's able to do the squat and she's able to tolerate the squat, I don't give a sh do your squats, sure. right? So, but the power clean's a different animal, yeah. right? The investment that the lifter is going to make and the coach is going to make in teaching and coaching and programming is programming the power clean is trickier than people think it is, right? Sure it is. So the investment and time and effort that both parties are going to make in the development of that exercise just requires a certain level of commitment. And so I think the desire is important in a way that it's not for the other exercises sure. that we prescribe. You got to do the other ones. Yeah, you got to do Everybody has to everybody squat. Everybody has to squat. Everybody has to deadlift. Right. Not everybody has to power clean. By the way, as much as I argue about power clean, I actually really enjoy doing the power clean. When I do it, I actually really like it. I love the power clean. You know where a lot of this comes from? That there's a couple places there. It's that, so you think about my background so you can understand how I've kind of come to this conclusion. So number one, I was a coach coaching by the hour at Strong Gym that I owned, right? So I owned the gym. I wasn't getting paid by the hour, but you charge your clients by the hour. And when you've got lots and lots of personal training clients, they got basically an hour long session. Now, could I have done an hour and a half long session? Sure. We could have figured out, changed the policy and entire pricing structure of the gym. But where I was pretty good at getting people in and getting them out and doing LP or HLM or something like that. Within an hour, I could do it. That's awesome. When I added the power clean, I couldn't do that. Nope. So that would change things. I have a ton of people email me and want to come in and see me from out of town. And I've recognized that I can teach the four slow lifts in two hours. And it actually usually takes like two hours and 15 minutes, but I'll only charge them for two hours. Also, it's, that's good customer service, right? So you come in, it's, well, it's a couple hundred bucks an hour. It's two hours long. Then you coach them for two hours and 15 minutes, but you don't charge them for the extra time. Now, if we had the power clean, it's three hours. No. So what I tell people is people will come in, they want to get coaching in their list. So like, I want form checks and they'll come in. I'll say, look, you get two hours, you get the squat, you get the press and you get the deadlift. You want the bench and power clean. That's another consult. Makes me sound a little bit like an ass, but yeah. that's what I need in terms of time. You don't want to be rushed. I don't want to be rushed. I want to give people the attention that they're paying for. Sure. And so I'm not going to tack the power clean onto the end of a two hour concert. I'm with you 100% yeah. there. And so, yeah, I can't stand doing it. I'm looking at charity. I kind of like that. You know, we'll have people press and bench in this intro session, and then they never bench. We have a press first, mm -hmm. and they never bench. You never even sniff like their regular three by five because they've already pressed pretty heavy. Sure. So they don't get the good Same out of thing. the bench that they could otherwise. So I kind of like the idea that, and it needs less instruction typically as well. But the problem is, is that I have so many people coming in out of town right. from Little Rock on a Saturday morning, right. five hour drive up, they get themselves a session and then they have to go back to Little Rock. So then that second session, if they really want another session two months down the road before they get it again. They can't get it tomorrow right. or the next day. But that's just, you know, that's the nature of the beast. I get it. Yeah, that's the way it falls. What I find with the benches is that by the time, you know, if we have a little bit extra time, I get, okay, we got a little extra time. We got through your squat press dead. They're not as bad as you thought. The squat often is not as bad as they think. The deadlift is often not as bad as they think. And they'll be like, yeah, my press is fine. Unless your press it's is terrible. Up. But then you <laughs> fix the press, right? What are the big problems with the press? You know, sure, the body moves, but they always get the grip wrong. Wrong. Grip's wrong. The grip is always Elbows wrong. Elbows are down. Right. Wrist is bent. So and then they there are the bar in front a number of, of things that you fix in the press. Now they go to the bench press. And now they're prefixed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're prefixed. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Do it all the time. Yeah. So for me, the hour-long sessions that I've done in the past, the out-of-town sessions, it makes it a lot more expensive from a financial sort of economy piece. And the last one is this online coaching. The clean is so much harder to coach online than any of the other lifts. And so... It's very hard to walk up to a clean to have read your coach's feedback from Monday, and then you're probably not cleaning on Wednesday anyway. Maybe now you're not cleaning again until Friday or whatever. Maybe you're only cleaning once a week. And then you go back to next Wednesday and you read the instructions and to approach the bar with the single cue or the two cues that your coach gave you a week ago Man, that it's such a fast motor pattern. It doesn't carry I over. I hear you. Very so well. the coaching setting plays a role in your ability to select and coach the exercise. I have an ace in the hole, which is that almost all of my clients are local to me. And so the ones right. for whom I prescribe the clean, I can say, you just get your ass in here. Let's work the clean. Let's work yeah. the snatch, right? So for me, that's my ace in the hole. And that's kind of why I've set up my stable of clients. Yeah, that makes sense. And the ones who are remote, I, you know, they're not going to clean anyway. So I want to see your 81 year old lady clean. 
It's not going to happen. She I wouldn't could. do that to her. Yeah, actually, you know, she's she pretty. Could. She's pretty damn athletic. If you met her in person, I bet you could get her clean. I've actually had this recurring fantasy. It's like she's so awesome of like going up there to Vancouver. It's like God, can you yeah, imagine? She's, cool. she's way cool. Yeah, she's way cool. So I've seen you teach 15, 18 people to clean at once. Yeah. You know, Matt's really efficient with getting them taught, you know, line them all up mm -hmm. and get them taught. And then, so you were getting these guys in and out in an hour. And so I've been working harder on doing that. Yeah. So when I get up to their uh, first squat work set, we start their press warm up while they're resting from their squat. Yeah. Then they wrap that up. And then when they start their press work sets, we start warming up their deadlift and, you know, and I want to talk to them and I want to you know, answer questions and stuff. And I've, man, I can, I can get a normal guy, an LP out of there in an hour now, sure. but you got to, you got to overlap those. And see so people that are listening are like, man, my sessions are taking an hour 40. Well, do more than one thing at a time, yeah. you know, and it works. Always mm. stimulating, sir. Likewise. I really enjoy this. I really enjoy this. And you know, the other thing is, I got to give you guys kudos and, and for our props. titles. Our no, no. Titles? I mean, you guys knew that, you know, I had a different perspective, you know, that this was going to be a little bit contentious and you brought me on anyway and let me have my say. And, and I love you guys for that. Well, thank you. Thank you. You have convinced me to teach it a little more. Okay, <laughs> good. Then I've done a good day's work. Well, I mean, I think we had a good Socratic discussion about this yeah. thing and our listeners can kind of hear it and make their own and decisions. Make, make decisions. You do I, you. I don't know that we disagree about hardly anything, which is really what happens when you have these discussions is you realize, well, you think you disagree about 80%, and then when you get into it, you actually only disagree about, about eight, 20 about 8%. Yeah, you know, yeah. just not that much. And then there's that other piece of it that goes, the part that we disagree about really isn't that important anyway. Right. right? Like, your way works, and our way works. I wouldn't have any problem if you coached my mom or my wife or my kids, and you taught them how to clean. In fact, I would prefer it. <laughs> yeah, actually, in fact. And uh, they would do just fine. So, yeah. Well, go check out Dr. Solomon's channel on YouTube. It's Gray Steel and subscribe. He's going to tell you why you should eat the egg yolk. That's right. And he's going to tell you everything that you need to know because he's a responsible person like that. He's a teacher and a doctor and a gentleman and a writer of science fiction, I hear. This is true. Well, formally, that part of me is resting now, but uh, I have done that <laughs> in the past. A, you're recovering and you're going to express a science fiction adaptation. I've, and... I've, I've got other things I'm doing right now, but I did go through a phase where I wrote a lot of science fiction and published some of it, and uh, it was fun. Is there any of that still available? Oh, yeah. It's out there on the web. Uh, How might they find that? Some of my stories are published at... Um, Escape Pod, which is an audio podcast where they bought some of my stories and read them online. So it's like oh. an audiobook version. I'm in a few anthologies. There's an anthology called Year's Best Fantasy Six. I'm in that. I'm in an anthology called People of the Book and in an older one called Bones of the World, which I don't know if is in print anymore. I was in some of the magazines, so those are hard to get a hold of. And I've got a little bit at sullydog.com, which is like this old website that I don't even really curate anymore. So, And you wrote under your, your real name? I wrote under my real name. Yeah, awesome. I bet we can find it. Dr. Sullivan contains multitudes, you know it? As do we all. Not surprised. Well, that's another Barbell Logic episode. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll talk to you in a couple of days. Bye.